evening. I can see there's still plenty of people joining us for tonight's Intensive Care Society Education Seminar. I'm just going to wait a moment for that number to settle and then we'll start. I'm Jeremy Beauty from the Intensive Care Society Council. I've got the pleasure of hosting this evening's seminar. This evening's seminar, as you know, is on the future of targeted rehabilitation from the ICU to home. I'd first like to thank our Intensive Care Society members and charitable donors who've helped fund this evening's seminar. And also particularly like to thank our speakers who we'll be hearing from in just a moment. So tonight we have Dr. Bronwyn Connolly. She's a senior lecturer at the Wellcome Wilson Institute for Experimental Medicine at the Queen's University of, of Belfast. And she's talking about the team trial for, of early activity and mobilization. That will be seamlessly follow, followed by Dr. Manu Shankahari, NIHR clinician scientist, reader and consultant in intensive care medicine at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital and King's College London. And he'll be talking about the sepsis survivor prognosis score. And that will then again be seamlessly followed by Dr. Sudin Puthakiri, senior clinical lecturer in intensive care medicine at the William Harvey Research Institute, Barts in the London, Queen Mary University of London. And he'll be talking about the screening of post intensive care syndrome and the work from the National Post Intensive Care Rehabilitation Collaborative. So each talk will go seamlessly one from, the, from one to the next. And I, can I please encourage you to use the question answer function, the tab on the, on the Zoom at the bottom, not the chat function. And then all questions will be answered by round table at the end. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion at the end. So please do stay for that. And without further ado, we'll start the talks. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Bronwyn Connolly. I'm a senior lecturer in critical care at Queen's University in Belfast and I'll be presenting this evening on the TEAM trial, which is the trial of early activity and mobilisation in ICU. And the TEAM trial is led by Professor Carol Hodgson as the chief investigator and Carol is based at the ANZICS Research Centre in Melbourne, Australia. And Carol also chairs the International Management Committee for the TEAM trial. And the team trial is funded by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council. It's supported by a number of other organisations, including endorsement from the ANZIX Clinical Trials Group. And in the UK, the trial is coordinated by myself and Doug Gould from ICNARC, who are also the UK sponsor. And the background for the team trial centres on our understanding of physical impairment in patients with critical illness, that this is common, significant and persistent, and influences recovery long after the ICU discharge has occurred. In previous trials of physical rehabilitation interventions delivered after ICU or hospital discharge haven't shown favourable effects to, to date. And that could be because of a, a variety of methodological factors. For example, the target population anticipated to benefit from those interventions and included in those studies. The dose of the intervention evaluated in these trials and whether that was the optimum dose of intervention possible. What usual care looks like in comparison to those interventions and the huge variety of outcomes used for evaluation, as well as whether these trials were sufficiently delivered in terms of quality of intervention delivery um, and, and whether intervention fidelity was present. And so whilst we don't have a robust evidence base for the effectiveness of interventions delivered after ICU or hospital discharge, lends us to question whether or not physical rehabilitation should begin earlier within the ICU. And that's certainly the premise for the team trial. And the trial is the cumulation of an extensive research program over the last 10 years led by Carol and her group that have included these two key preparatory studies the first being an observational study of early mobilisation practices across Australia and New Zealand. And the second being the pilot feasibility trial that tested the team intervention prior to its evaluation in the current definitive study. But the research programme has also included the development and validation of the ICU mobility scale as an outcome measure and various systematic reviews that have evaluated the effectiveness of early mobilisation activities on, on various patient outcomes. <clears throat> 
And so the aim of the team trial is to determine whether early activity and mobilisation during prolonged invasive mechanical ventilation increases the number of days alive and out of hospital to day 180 compared to standard care. The trial is a, an assessor blinded parallel group randomised control trial that will enrol 750 patients from around 45 sites internationally. And the last scheduled patient recruitment is at the end of August 2021 to allow for database closure analysis and interpretation and then the final reporting thereafter. In terms of outcomes for the trial, the primary outcome is the number of days alive and out of hospital between randomization and 180 days. And any days spent in a rehabilitation or nursing home facility are counted as days in hospital. So this is a composite primary outcome measure that reflects both mortality and morbidity. So we'll be capturing duration of hospital stay, the need for ongoing rehabilitation or nursing home care, and the occurrence of readmissions within that. And then there are a variety of secondary outcome measures that include duration of ICU and hospital stay that will be reported for both uh, survivors and non-survivors, uh, ventilator free days and delirium free days. And then at day 180, a number of secondary outcomes that are mortality, health status, activities of daily living, function and disability status, cognitive function and psychological function. And in terms of who are uh, who are enrolling into the trial and who are eligible for this, we're enrolling adults who are intubated and expected to remain invasively mechanically ventilated until the day after tomorrow. And they also need to demonstrate sufficient cardiovascular and respiratory stability to allow for mobilisation to occur. And these two factors are defined in more specific detail during this, the screening process but broadly include the extent of inotropic uh, requirements and the status of cardiac function and the level of ventilatory support such as PEEP, FiO2 and the need for additional techniques such as proning or neuromuscular blockade. And there are a number of pragmatic clinical exclusion criteria that are aiming to enrol um, a, a population who are likely to benefit from the intervention. And that includes excluding patients who were dependent for activities of daily living in the month prior to enrolment, uh, those with documented cognitive impairment, uh, patients with proven or suspected neurological pathology, spinal cord injury or neuromuscular disease. So anything that isn't uh, a typical um, intensive care unit acquired weakness presentation. Where patients have rest in bed and or lower limb non weight bearing orders for, for obvious practical reasons where the life expectancy is less than six months, where the condition is palliative and there's no further active treatment planned, where this is not the first ICU admission involving invasive mechanical ventilation, and where the patient has been eligible for 72 hours or more and hasn't been enrolled during that time. And so in terms of the study outline, obviously patients are screened for varying amounts of time during the ICU and patients can become eligible at different time points during their admission. But once they are screened as eligible and randomised into the trial, they receive the team protocol for up to 28 days or death or discharge from critical care, whichever might come sooner. They are then followed up and as I've mentioned the primary outcome is number of days alive and out of hospital to day 180 and then with the remaining secondary outcomes collected centrally by ICNARC at day 180 as I've previously described. And the team intervention uh, is a primarily physiotherapy assessed and administered intervention that centres on early goal directed mobilisation. So patients are, um, once they've met the randomization criteria, they undergo uh, an assessment for physiological stability, which mirrors very closely the cardiovascular and respiratory assessment that was required during screening for enrollment. They then undergo a mobility assessment that looks at their highest level of activity on the ICU mobility scale. And you can see, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the ICU mobility scale, on, on the right-hand side table there, the ICU mobility scale is a, an ordinal scale ranging from 0 to 10 that describes the varying um, increasingly hierarchical functional activities that we would move through with patients as they increase their functional uh, physical functional ability. So for example, uh, level one, which is sitting in bed or exercising in bed, 
level three, sitting over the edge of the bed and then progressing through standing, transfer, stepping and walking until patients can walk independently without a gait aid. And so during the team intervention, patients are assessed for their highest level of mobility on this scale. And once that's determined, that corresponds with a target time period of activity that they need to undertake for that day. So if they are assessed, for example, at an ICU mobility scale of level three, which is sitting over the edge of the bed, then their planned target duration of activity is 30 minutes. If they're assessed at an ICU mobility scale of uh, four to six, which is standing and marching on the spot at the bedside, then their target activity uh, duration for that day is 45 minutes. And those activity periods should be based around activities at that highest mobility level. So for example, if they are able to stand and march on the spot, then that's where the activity would start from. Uh, and it can then it can then progress down uh, if patients aren't able to meet that entire planned duration of activity at that intensity, they can downgrade that if necessary. And so it may be that the planned time period is delivered in multiple sessions uh, and, and moving down the intensity levels as required. So it's very much patient dependent and allows us to um, to deliver a bespoke patient intervention that will give us more information around the dose of, of intervention around timing and activity and intensity level. In terms of recruitment for the trial, it's going really well. As you can see from this recruitment graph, it's, re it's recruiting incredibly well to time and target. There's around 39 sites out of the approximately 45 that are enrolled. And as well as across Australia and New Zealand, there are also sites in Germany, Ireland, the UK uh, and Brazil. And in terms of Team UK, I'd really like to, to say a huge thank you on behalf of, of Doug from, from ICNARC and myself to the following sites who are involved in Team uh, within the UK and, and a huge thanks for their support and engagement with the trial, especially in the last six months or so with the, with the various pandemic circumstances that we've all been working with. So really great to be working with these sites uh, and looking forward to continuing to, to conduct the team trial here. Thanks also to the NIHR Clinical Research Network for support that the trial is, is listed on the portfolio. And with that, I'll draw to a close and uh, thank you for your attention. And there's some information here if you would like to contact Carol or myself for the team trial. Uh, feel free to follow on Twitter as well uh, and thank you all for your attention. And now I'd like to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Manu Shankahari, who's going to be presenting on the sepsis survivor prognosis score. Thanks very much. Good evening and thank you uh, very much to the Intensive Care Society and the organizers of the webinar for the opportunity to discuss the SIPS score or the Sepsis Survivor Prognosis score. Um, acknowledgements and disclaimers. Um, I'm funded through an NIHR Clinician Scientist Award. Uh, what are these views are mine and not necessarily the NHS, NIHR or the Department of Health and Social Care. I do not have any conflicts of interest directly relevant to this talk other than the fact that I'm uh, the researcher who generated the score. Um, a big shout out to my uh, co-authors of the manuscript and collaborators, um, particularly uh, IGNARC. Uh, the data comes from IGNARC and without which none of this work is possible. And a big thank you to Cathy, uh, David Paloma from the IGNARC team and uh, Gordon Rubenfeld from Toronto and myself. And the paper is open access and you can easily um, download it and read it in greater detail. So what's the great idea, the big idea here? Uh, it's a very simple idea. Uh, could we develop a clinically useful, uh, simple prognostic score um, using the sepsis admission characteristics uh, as predictors for the outcome of unplanned rehospitalization or death in the first year after hospital discharge amongst adult sepsis survivors. And I think the goal would be that this may inform clinical pathways to reduce the survivorship burden in these patients. Let's consider why uh, I, we chose uh, index sepsis admission characteristics. 
uh, we did two systematic reviews to inform uh, this work. The first systematic review looked at the relationship between sepsis and long-term mortality, in particular one and two year mortality following sepsis in adult sepsis survivors. And the second uh, looked at the rate and risk factors for rehospitalization in uh, sepsis survivors. What these two systematic reviews consistently highlight amongst something like 110 odd studies um, is that you could categorize the risk factors for death, long-term mortality, and for rehospitalization after discharge into two groups, generic, which are patient characteristics such as age, sex, having comorbidities, having a hospitalization prior to the index sepsis admission, and two index sepsis characteristics such as what is the site of infection, do you have septic shock, how many organ dysfunctions do you have, what organ supports did you get, so on and so forth. Why did we kind of choose the uh, outcome of one year mortality or one year risk of rehospitalization? I think these are two common outcomes. Roughly one in six patients die in the first year following hospital discharge, and two in five or 40% of these patients are rehospitalized at least once in the year following uh, discharge after sepsis. These are patient centered outcomes, these are relevant to healthcare, and these are outcomes that can't be misclassified. You're either hospitalized, you're not hospitalized. Um, and those are the reasons why we felt that this is a good outcome to uh, kind of study. And if we change one or more of these outcomes, uh, that may help uh, patient uh, sepsis survivors in a long way. So let's look at a brief overview of the study design. Um, so our study cohort or the exposure being survived the index sepsis hospitalization uh, after a critical illness. We follow these patients up from that time point to the end of follow-up, which is 365 days. What we are looking for are the outcome events, which is either rehospitalization or death in the by the three within the 365 day window. And the risk factors or the predictors that we considered are generic predictors such as age, comorbidity, sex, and so on, and hospital type and sepsis-specific characteristics, such as site of infection, number and type of organ dysfunction, and uh, the organ support that these patients receive. So that forms the essentially the, the tripod summary of developing a prognostic score as to what we did. A bit more uh, info on the study cohort. Uh, the study cohort is from the ICNA case mix program data. Uh, this is essentially data from all of, almost all of the English ICUs. Um, so thank you to the, those who provide data to the case mix program. And what we did was to link the case mix program data to the hospital episode statistic data. And the derivation cohort consists of adult sepsis survivors, um, approximately 95,000 of them. Uh, as I said, the critical care units in England is a setting. The analysis for the developing and validating the model is a logistic regression analysis. Um, we start with 20 predictors. Uh, we do a stepwise sequential uh, reduction and elimination. We eliminated complex predictors such as Apache 2 physiology score. We, we excluded low value predictors uh, where the, the additional risk provided by the predictor is not um, kind of great. We validated in two different ways, a bootstrap internal validation uh, with 20 uh, reps and limited external validation with what, with a cohort of patients uh, consisting of 25,000 of patients. Um, temporarily separate, but collected using the same uh, case definitions. So let's look at the, uh, some of the key results, uh, the outcome events. Um, the figure on the left shows the proportion of patients having an unplanned rehospitalization. If you follow up patients between zero to 365 days, uh, roughly 46.9% of the patients have had at least one or more rehospitalization in the year following hospital discharge. Most common uh, rehospitalization diagnosis is infection, uh, which may have uh, relevance to some of the clinical trials that we do. The figure on the right is mortality. And I think the, the only point I want to make with that figure is the risk of dying in the first year is way higher in those patients who had at least one rehospitalization episode. So to kind of uh, summarize the discussion thus far, we have studied a cohort of patients who survived the sepsis hospitalization, 
the common scenario is that nearly 45% of these patients have at least one or more rehospitalization, and that rehospitalization increases their risk of death. A less common scenario is a sepsis survivor never having undergone rehospitalization but goes on to uh, die in the first year, which is a very uncommon scenario, at least in the ICU data within England that we, were, that we studied. Uh, I won't dwell in the uh, logistic regression model in great detail. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, but uh, the model essentially ended up with a eight predictor scope. Uh, first predictor being previous hospitalization. If you had one or more re one or more hospitalization in the year preceding your index sepsis admission, you got a greater chance of getting rehospitalized in the or dying in the first subsequent year. As you get older, your risk goes up. Um, the IMD 2015 or the index of deprivation quintile, uh, this is based on uh, postcode uh, within England um, and it is, uh, it is operationalizable easily uh, because we will collect postcode uh, as part of our clinical data collection. So, and the folk with the greatest degree of deprivation have the highest risk. If you had pre-admission dependence, uh, greater the pre-admission dependence, uh, greater the risk. And remember, within the case mix program database, the pre-admission dependence uh, will be uh, linkable to frailty if you are interested. If you got one or more comorbidities, that increases your risk. Uh, if you're an emergency surgical admission compared to an elective surgical admission or a medical admission, uh, you have a greater risk. A lower hemoglobin level at admission increases your risk, probably a marker of chronic comorbidity or chronic uh, uh, illness or frailty. If the site of infection, we use neurological as a reference category, and as you can see, uh, other sites of infection uh, carry a risk, and the greatest risk being the cardiovascular, and uh, musculoskeletal and dermatological do not add to the overall risk. So let's look at the uh, prognosis score. The figure A highlights the distribution of the prognosis score, x-axis being the score, which runs from 0 to 22, and y-axis being the proportion of patients in the database, uh, in, the, in the derivation cohort. As you can see, um, nearly 85% of patients had at least a score of five or more. The figure B uh, highlights the fact that we have developed a prognostic score that is um, uh, that increases your risk as the score increases. That's what you would expect to see. And what you're seeing there is the cumulative incidence of the outcome uh, at different scores. Figure C and D are the performance of the score. Um, the area under the curve for the score is modest, which is 0 0.68, uh, but uh, it is uh, the predicted versus the observed risk uh, is appropriately calibrated. I think in this context, you would start to think, so what and who cares? It's another prognostic score. But actually, um, this is where we think the score adds value. Uh, I'll explain why I think so. So the, let's think about the current clinical scenario as to what you and me do uh, at the bedside. When patients, uh, sepsis survivors, leave hospital, we never assess them for their risk of rehospitalization or death in the first year. We don't provide consistent follow-up. Um, we do not know uh, what the preferences of sepsis survivors are as to what risk they're willing to consider. And we do not have any effective treatment. So all of those things uh, become um, the reasons why these, this score may be useful in our setting because we derived it based on the uh, data from England. And this is also where the, uh, an analysis comes in, which is called a decision curve analysis. Uh, this uses two principles. Um, the, they are the threshold probability and the net benefit. So threshold probability is, um, is, think about a sepsis survivor, you're having this discussion and you're proposing a treatment. And the treatment comes with risk versus benefit. So at threshold probability is a point at which a sepsis survivor considers benefit of any treatment that you propose for a moderate or high risk survival is equivalent to the harm of overtreatment from a low risk survival. The net benefit is the expect, difference between the expected benefit and harm. 
and I, I'm going to kind of explain this in the next slide a bit more because I think this is the core reason why I think it's worthwhile considering implementing this core in our intensive care units in the UK. So here, the x-axis uh, shows the risk um, and it also highlights the, the risk at which the patient or clinician will opt for a treatment and y-axis being the net benefit. And there are different uh, lines within it. And uh, the line at the top, always line, is you treat everybody. And, and you know, and, uh, and I do, that we don't do that. Um, and I think what the score highlights, when we use the score to consider whether it's useful to have a score, uh, the score performs better than a treat-all scenario, which means that you could consider managing this patient follow-up using risk. And the bottom line, which is zero, uh, you don't do anything. And I think that is not appropriate for the reasons I don't need to rehearse. Then you have a scenario at which what cut point would you use? And I think the based, it comes down to uh, very simply uh, based on the patient preferences and the resource we have. And I think a score of seven, which kind of accounts for roughly 55% of the patients, seem, seven or more seems an appropriate cutoff for, based on our analysis, to follow up patients. And that gives you an unplanned rehospitalization risk or death of around 40%. And I think that is a guess where people would consider uh, kind of an intervention. So to uh, summarize, uh, the SIP score or the sepsis survivor uh, prognosis score, uh, consists of eight simple variables that we all collect as part of the day-to-day uh, -day clinical practice. And our decision curve analysis uh, implies that you can do follow-up care based on uh, the score than a treat-all scenario. And there's a free online tool, uh, and the link to that is uh, highlighted there. And it, you don't need to log in, you don't need to register. Uh, we collect only minimal data, which is the data that you put in uh, to uh, show uh, what um, the performance of the score is to inform your discussion uh, with the patients. And, I'll, and I just at this point want to introduce uh, my next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Zudin Patichery. He is a consultant intensivist and uh, his research focuses on muscle biology and recovery following critical illness. Uh, over to Zudin. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Um, I'm going to present to you some data from the Intensive Care Rehabilitation Working Party, which was a meeting convened uh, during as part of the National Emergency Critical Care Response to bring a group of cross-disciplinary sector rehabilitation experts together and try to find an ideal rehabilitation pathway for the nation that was applicable from the smallest DGHs to the largest teaching hospitals. And we ended up with this document working together with the British Society of Rehabilitation Medicine and we called it Responding to COVID-19 and Beyond, a framework for assessing early, early rehabilitation needs following treatment in intensive care. The idea being that we would use this COVID-19 response to develop something that would be sustainable and help all intensive care survivors, not just those with coronavirus. And this is necessary because the, is that there is a, uh, a complicated pathway for our intensive care survivors as they recover through their acute period and start to begin rehabilitation within the, the hospital, but also within the community, where one starts to support their discharge, reintegrate them into the community, and plan for all of these processes. So we needed something that would translate across all the, these pathways and the continuum of recovery for these critical illness survivors. And this is where the pickups tool sits. It's, it's the comprehensive clinical assessment is a screening tool as patients step down off intensive care, essentially for post-intensive care syndrome. And then further down the line, the pickups plus does the same thing again as they go into the community. And both of these inform the rehabilitation prescription, which is a personalized prescription of rehabilitation needs for the patient that accompanies them throughout their journey back to, uh, well, to recovery and to, into health, we hope. 
and this is what it does. It's a screening tool for functional disabilities. It establishes the baseline deficits and ICU discharge and highlights which specialties are needed uh, to input for that specific patient and allows you then to call in these specialties who will have their own screening tools and old, own diagnostic tools and apply this to the patient which informs the rehabilitation prescription. This occurs again at ward discharge as we as the pick as using the pickups plus again we have the specialty assessment inform the rehabilitation prescription in conjunction with some of the patients and the families as the patients then get discharged down their rehabilitation pathway and the pickups tool is compliant with all the existing frameworks both the critical care ones the nice cg83 but also the british society of rehabilitation medicine core standards for rehabilitation following acute care so there's no dissonance in its use. Well, here we are, 157 days into the pro into this, and I'm going to show you some data of how we've worked through these four four major uh, streams: community engagement, user engagement, tool assessment, and data management, all funneled through the National Post Intensive Care Rehabilitation Collaborative. At the onset. The need for a screening tool for post-intensive care syndrome was recognised by a variety of colleges um, and, the, and they offered to endorse this very early on. These are those professional bodies that did so. As time went on, further, the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of General Practitioners endorsed our work and the Welsh Intensive Care Society did this too along, along with the Welsh Critical Care and Trauma Network. In fact, our Welsh colleagues are integrating the pickup tool and rehabilitation prescription into electronic health records in Wales, and it's highly likely that they'll be leading the United Kingdom in uh, having a, a systematic approach to rehabilitation for intensive care survivors. We've also engaged the Department of Health and Social Care via the University of York Rapid Response Team. And Anna Castro and Karen Bloor have kindly offered us some of their data from their rapid review of national rehabilitation practices. And they, they, the two major conclusions that really struck me was there appeared to be a highly imperfect communication between the hospital and the GPs as they tend to, to rely on discharge summaries and letters. Uh, even before the pandemic, it was not always clear which aspects of the post intensive care are the responsibility of the hospital and which is primary care. So you can see why our primary care colleagues were quite taken with a rehabilitation prescription leading to their endorsement because it really solves many of our communication issues and it ties rehabilitation to the patient as opposed to the services. And we went out to engage a whole bunch of users. We went to 26 different acute hospitals in the United Kingdom and got a whole variety of people to use the pickups tool on rehabilitation prescription. And we asked them what it was like. And they said it generally described the patients that they were seeing it was a comprehensive overview and it was easy to use. We asked if it triggered engagement and they said yes. It allowed other MDT members to be highlighted in the patient's pathway and it allowed for identifying of missed needs and future recommendations. And it's been a good way of bringing the whole MDT together and be particularly beneficial in areas where there isn't already an MDT presence. Uh, Julie Highfield tells me that only 19% of trusts have access to a clinical psychologist. So you can see that in smaller hospitals or where we haven't got a complete MDT, a screening tool highlighting the patient's needs could be very useful. And certainly the patients that we've engaged with do think it's useful. This is a lady from Plymouth who has the pickup spot on her wall and allows her to see her progress easily. We've got rec recommendations for refinement for version two, and, our, and everyone's asked us to improve some of our definitions, track longitudinal change better, and include family care as, a, as one of the domains. Lynn Turner Stokes and myself have gone on to do some tool assessments. I think it's very important that we looked at 468 assessments across the continuum of rehabilitation. And we found that uh, the pickups tool on the splat, this is a, an example of a splat where the yellow is the first assessment and the blue is the second assessment was actually very very responsive to uh, patients function over time in fact as we go through the cosmin checklist it turns out that in our preliminary clinometric analysis that the pickup tool is probably going to have very good content validity good structural validity it's very responsive as i mentioned and overall it's going to be a good tool and we're going to we're just 
plowing through the clinometric analysis at the moment in the hope to um, get something out to publications only. Lastly, we've, moved, we've been working a lot on our data management. Uh, the data is held centrally at the moment through a, the UK Rock Collaborative Clinical Registry. And we've been sharing our data and our progress with NHS England, the CRA's director, the AHP Leadership Centre, so Caroline Poole. Uh, we'll be sharing it with local trusts and our, we've been working with people to develop local workforce plans. For example, civil trusts have found that they don't have clinical psychologists. And they've used this for business, these data for business cases to employ a clinical, a clinical psychologist. In the future, we've been, we'd like to link some of these data with ICNARC and ISERIC, but we haven't really begun to engage this process yet. If this is to go forward, we will need to get consent from patients. Most of these data were collected during the waiver of some of the information governance rules during the pandemic, the first pandemic, the first wave of the pandemic, I should say. Um, and we asked people what they thought the capacity for consent was for central data governance, data collection. And it seems this is reasonably low and variable between 10 to 70%. So if we are to go forward to use pickups in the rehab prescription, um, we will need to be looking for a centralized mandate for this realistically and why why is this all really, why we need these data well these are the workforce data that are coming through so the y-axis is percentage of patients and i've split up the patients into covid related admissions and non-covid related admissions. and you can see there's a pretty high burden of workforce need for these patients um, and in fact the average patient uh, workforce needs is five therapies so everyone needs essentially a physiotherapist an occupational therapist a speech and language therapist a psychologist and a dietitian and um, and the COVID-19 patients need slightly more of these patients but the pattern is the same we went on to look at the pattern specifically and these are the entire workforce and you can see the interdependencies of the workforce needs in this network analysis no single therapy is central to the process patients essentially need all five in a combined fashion this is a team process of rehabilitation and when we added the COVID-19 data this didn't change so the rehabilitation needs of our COVID-19 patients are essentially the same as a non-COVID-19 patient having said that those patients with coronavirus were more likely to be given a community rehabilitation or be offered inpatient rehabilitation. And we need to sort of, we need to drill down on this and understand why this is the case and whether this is a true referral or in fact a lack of equity. So our next hundred days involve us collating uh, the last bits of our data, analyzing and get, continuing to disseminate our findings and engagement for winter and second wave preparation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for a great series of presentations there, which I'm sure will raise plenty of discussion and should generate it. There's about a hundred people on the webinar this evening. Uh, perhaps we'll first start with Bronwyn's talk whilst there's some questions uh, from the audience. And, um, and, I, and I certainly encourage other members of the panel also to ask questions, but um, I suppose Bronwyn, it's, it's um, when I was hearing the talk, and obviously we have to declare a conflict of interest that we are about to start participating in the team throughout the Bristol World Infirmary, so I should first say that. But do we know how much activity patients typically receive at present? Because that would, do we know what the baseline is for patients? Yeah, so that's, it's a really important question. And I think the, the simple answer is not as much as we think that we give patients. Uh, if I if I could put it in a very simple way, um, it's really variable. Uh, usual care we know varies significantly from ICU to ICU and, and from hospital to hospital. So when we've done various point prevalence and observational studies, the rates of uh, mobility and, and various activity practices with patients is is quite low and, and 
the amount of out of bed activity that patients are doing is, is hugely uh, underestimated, I think, by what we would think that we are doing with patients. Um, and I think often we are skewed perhaps in our um, perceptions by some of the patients that, that are either long stay or acquire a significant rehabilitation input. But on the whole, when you look at it across populations, the level of input is very low. So the, the team trial will, will kind of pick up on two aspects of, of early mobilization practice, both the timing and the duration of sessions that patients receive and also the intensity of activity. Uh, that they receive and, and we're trying to make sure that we collect usual care data as robustly as possible so that we can make sure that there are both separations between groups and that we can very clearly characterize the usual care arm. Great and I think it's wonderful to hear about the use prescription because that was clearly a theme that sort of runs through from that team trial right into Zudin's work thinking about the, a focus on prescribing this and um, a targeted um, you know focus on rehabilitation which is sort of came across in 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 the work that you're doing Sudan. I don't know if you've got any comments to make on on the importance of that if that if that's something you think is significant. Well, so I think it's hugely important I was actually just looking at um, Rachel Moses' comment that saying and I think it ties very much into this saying there's huge variance in the chat saying huge variance in access to rehabilitation but quality and how do we start addressing these inequalities well actually I think Bronwyn's doing that right now, aren't you, Bronwyn, with the Fickham uh, lackey. So while we've gone and looked at what the patients need and what the what workforce needs the patients require, um, Fickham and the lackey, Life After Critical Illness, have gone and looked at the other side of the coin to say, well, what are the workforces available? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think these are two complementary bits of information, Rachel, that we can then start to look at inequalities afterwards. Um, and only by looking at these inequalities can we start talking about addressing individualised individualized care. Mm -hmm. I'd also pick up on the word prescription, um, which mm. I think is, is, has challenged us in terms of, of providing evidence to demonstrate benefit of rehabilitation interventions. Rehab by default is a hugely complex intervention, and you've seen that through Zudin's work, that the interrelation between all of the different therapy professions if you prescribe a drug, it's very simple. Uh, you have a dose, you have a frequency, you have how many times a day do you want it, and you can tick off on a prescription chart that you've got it. If you try to prescribe a rehabilitation intervention, you know, how, how do you do that? So we, we, we know that patients need rehab, we know the types that they need, but actually trying to translate that into a language that means we can test the effectiveness of those interventions is, is a really huge step that we haven't. Uh, managed to to master yet so I think the the work in clinical practice is going to be hugely valuable for us uh, and I think is going to help us look into the different pathways that we need but we also do need to kind of have one eye on the fact that when we're talking about these that we really need to look at how we address the evidence base around some of this as well to help us in the long term and you know, my caution around using the words about pres prescription perhaps is that, you know, we, we're, we need to be clear about the components of that and, and what that means. So I, I kind of caution around that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Bronwyn? Manu, thank you. I think it's kind of a combination of Bron and Zidin, but I'll start with Bron. Bron, you know, it's one of those, we've talked a bit about this before, which is um, if you, do you need to have a minimum dose for the kind of treatment to show efficacy, as it were, or effectiveness, whichever way you want to look at it? And how do we get that in the context of a rehab intervention? Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I, it depends, I suppose, on what you're looking at, whether you're looking at a clinical endpoint or something that's more mechanistic. So some of the studies will look at outcomes that are uh, physiological or biological, uh, and then you probably can have some have a kind of a more prescribed dose. So interventions like in bed cycling, for example, might lend themselves a little bit better to being able to set different parameters of a dose and then you can measure something that's very very specific whereas perhaps uh, you know what it takes to to sit a patient on the edge of the bed and do a sit to stand is really hard to kind of capture what that you know how much assistance are you needing how much intensity is that and for some patients a sit to stand 
might be much easier than it is to, to march on the spot. So the physiological difference between the intensities of both of those activities might be hugely different between patients. So I think there's a, there's a need to kind of marry up uh, the, the, the clinical side of it plus the, I suppose, the mechanistic side of it before we can, before we can understand it. But it's not easy. Um, and there's so many other non-physical issues around it. It's about how patients engage with rehabilitation, how they want to, you know, their motivation for it. And all of that impacts performance. Do, do you think that, um, is that a value in having something like a core outcome and a core outcome plus where the plus becomes all of these, uh, you know, in, interesting things to do? Anybody would think you would know what I was researching. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, certainly from the point of view of evaluating effectiveness of trials, a core outcome set is useful and, and there will be one on its way very soon. Um, but uh, yeah, you can easily bolt onto that other elements that if you were particularly focusing on biological work or physiological outcomes, you know, that you could add on to that, absolutely. And I think that's really important. We need to understand how all of these things work together and, and Zudan will, will know this and be able to speak to this much better than I can even around the links between, you know, the mechanisms of, of muscle function and strength and physical function and what that means at a clinical level. Thanks. Fine. I think perhaps we'll move on to Manu's talk and just consider um, the, the sepsis score, and then obviously bring the rehabilitation theme back in again with um, Zudin. So I suppose the, 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 there were several points that really struck me as I heard the talk, um, Manu, was, was obviously the, the focus around infection-related hospitalizations being so high in that group. Um, was it, were you saying that's about half of all hospitalizations are related to infection and whether or not we just heard call that as a sort of as a as a code for sepsis i don't know but um is, yeah. is that really what we're saying that, that so half what, of those missions so that, that seems yeah so essentially what we did so that's important to highlight what we did was to link the igna case mix program database to the hospital episode statistic in those patients who recover the, within the hospital episode statistic you have different codes for rehospitalization diagnoses and one of the codes for rehospitalization diagnoses is infection-related rehospitalization. And that is linked to the ICD code for infection plus the hospitalization code. So um, the systematic review that we did also highlights that the most common uh, reason for rehospitalization in sepsis survivors, uh, let me rephrase it. If a sepsis survivor is rehospitalized, half of those rehospitalization have an infection as primary or secondary diagnosis at that, at that time point at pre-hospitalization. And if you relate that to some of the other work that um, uh, Dr. Halle Prescott has done in the US where um, they use the veterans database and where they looked at a slightly different way of looking at the rehospitalization, uh, referring to them as ambulatory care sensitive conditions, which is if you got a COPD, if you manage your COPD well, your risk of rehospitalization following recovering from a COPD related pneumonia is decreased. So uh, the answer to your question is, Jeremy, I think uh, that is what we are seeing in the hospital episode statistics data linkage. And one of the things that I would like to do is to do this prospectively within critical care units uh, as a follow-up mechanism. Um, when patients leave critical care, give them an assessment of the risk that they're likely to have and then use that risk to inform their follow-up care. And when rehospitalization occurs, we'll have the prospective data with a bit more granularity as to what exactly was the reason for rehospitalization. Because it would suggest that some of that might be avoidable. True. That's, I think that's, that's the idea. Potentially. So, yeah, potentially avoidable. I think I, I deliberately didn't go into the immunology of it. So part of yes. one of the things that I'm doing is to vaccinate sepsis survivors and seeing whether vaccination reduces the risk of rehospitalization. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, it's called this Vassarus trial. We have recruited 124 patients. Our target is 214. Hopefully uh, in nine months time, if you invite me back, we might have a webinar on it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'll take you up on that. Um, and um, I suppose one thing that struck me linking Bronwyn's talk is that Bronwyn was focused on patients who have been prolonged, who received ventilation for a prolonged period of time. 
Yet that wasn't part of the sepsis survivor prognosis to the length of time on the ventilator or length of stay in hospital. Is that because that data wasn't considered as, no. as part of the, or, is, or, or may there be other factors that, that, that haven't been considered that where there isn't accurate data? I don't know. So uh, we considered uh, advanced respiratory support and hospital length of stay in the model and the IC length of stay and the duration of organ support. Uh, but the uh, remember that as the uh, patients stay in hospital uh, longer um, or they had a greater severity of illness, there is a competing risk to the outcome that we are studying. So um, some of those factors went away when you looked at the sepsis survival population. Intuitively, those become risk factors for hospital length of stay and hospital uh, infection during hospitalization. Once you get better and survive, those factors are unnecessarily related to the rehospitalization risk uh, in, the, in the cohort that we study. Thank you. Roman, that seems to have a question. Yeah, can, can I ask you, Manu, that, so with, with the risk of rehospitalization, how, how will your score or can, can the score be modified by, you know, people might be rehospitalized for other factors other than the things that, that have gone into the score and it might be around social support networks and, and, and the lack of a rehabilitation pathway or, or access to the services or they get dropped from the various other clinic appointments that they're meant to have how can we marry up your score with factors that are like that that are harder to capture so uh, the score uses only unplanned rehospitalization anything that is planned elective uh, did not get into the uh, score value as in the outcome wasn't outcome was unplanned rehospitalization so so if it was coded as an unplanned rehospitalization uh, that scenario um, it would have been in there uh, mm. But if it is if it is coded something different, it wouldn't. We also checked at the rehospitalization diagnosis, uh, which is shown in the manuscript in this supplement. And uh, the when you look at the rehospitalization diagnosis, you get a sense that, that those are all clinical conditions that bring them in, not the social uh, social support and the related stuff that bring them in. Uh, but it's a point that's well made in that you know there may be misclassifications in the reasons why they came in. Um, at least the primary or the secondary reason wasn't uh, this in the explicitly recorded. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm conscious there is quite a few comments here regarding Zudin's talk on the, uh, on the Q and A function, on the chat function. And I'd like to address some of those. And thank you so much for Mark for, um, uh, you know, contributing and, uh, and discussing the importance of surviving post-sepsis and you know it's it's uh, it's great to have uh, people who with direct experience who've been through this participating in this webinar so thank you Mark and um, so I don't know if you've got any comments to to make specifically regarding Mark's comments Sudin no, no, I've just said Thank you to Mark. Uh, I tried yeah. to answer some of the questions during uh, in the tech. So I put uh, someone asked about providing access to peer support and ICU steps. And Pam Ramsey, Pam Ramsey in Dundee has this great website about critical care recovery for patients. Um, so I put that on the chat. Um, I apologise to Nadine for saying psychology. Yes, liaison psychiatry can do this work, and I think. Part of where we are is trying to understand what the workforce is. We don't know what the workforce is and we just have to, and so we're learning about that. Um, and I guess the last question is from Pam about uh, experience using wearable tech. So we've used wearable tech for some studies which we've published. We're trying to go forward and look at patients. The, the problem, uh, if I may be honest, is that um, a lot of larger companies are very interested in this. They've gone to very select groups, and you can, if you go to very far, various hospitals, you will get your wearable tech checked. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of our patients are very poor. That does tend to put off many companies from investing in, the, in, in researching in them. And when I start talking about hard to reach populations, uh, deprived groups of people, people who don't speak English, it's very 
it seems striking how many companies lose interest in trying to do research in these in these populations. Um, so there are a few uh, groups doing looking at physical activity uh, using Apple Watches, using Garmin's uh, post coronavirus, uh, and not in but not in post intensive care. Generally speaking, they'll be targeting the wealthy patient who can engage is highly educated and highly unlikely to have significant coronavirus symptoms. And I think the, just to add to that, I think the, in the score again, the, those who essentially were on IMD um, highest deprivation, um, where they had a greater risk of rehospitalization. So something about this needs to be addressed at a national level at, with policy. Yeah. And we know that, of course, with coronavirus infection as well, that, uh, that deprivation is such a significant factor, which uh, has been uh, highlighted throughout all this. Um, so, so when we do, we do, I mean, going back to the score, Manu, do we think that it, it, uh, COVID will be ju just as the patients with coronavirus infection will just be, in terms of the score, being able to, it'll, it'll be applicable to that population just as any other patient with sepsis? So um, the... Intuitively, uh, um, uh, you know, you would expect that patients who survive COVID will have uh, and uh, will have some uh, post-critical illness-related um, problems that every single critical illness survivor would face. Um, the as a viral infection, some of the immunological sequelae will be very similar to that of sepsis. Um, these patients are also getting dexamethasone as routine care over a period of time. So that interaction during follow-up with stuff like musculoskeletal kind of health, uh, risk of um, infections longer term, et cetera, need to be considered. Um, there are residual lung abnormalities that has been reported already like early pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so again, the population of patients will have similar kind of um, long-term sequelae to that of a viral infection, so sepsis and that of somebody who's been ventilated for any other reason, like polytrauma. Or any, so score should be applicable, but I haven't studied that population per se, so I wouldn't sure. want to kind of say it's that. Too early. Too early to kind of come in, but it's, if it's one of those things where we can always test whether the score is useful in any way for that particular population. Okay, thank you. And I think this is probably a question for each member of the panel, which is Sean's question. It, it, regarding each of the areas of work, how are we measuring patients' engagement and satisfaction with, you know, with the team trial, with the sepsis survivor score? How are we engaging patients in that and with the, the pickups tool? So perhaps go to Bronwyn first and, and, and ask for her comments first and then go to each member. Yeah, so the, there's no formal evaluation or formal kind of assessment of patient engagement per se built into team. I, I think that that's partly down to the individual dynamics between uh, clinicians and patients, but there's no, uh, we have no formal metric of that per se within it. Uh, then may, Carol may have plans to, to go back to the patients who have taken part in the trial and kind of and look into that in further detail. But I think, you know, it's it's really difficult. I think it partly is, is not, it's not an easily measurable factor, yeah. but it means it's part of actually ident I understanding and identifying you know, what's important for a patient in their recovery. What does recovery mean for them? Uh, you know, it's all very well wanting to do some sit to stands and some, you know, walking mm -hmm. tests, but, you know, who, who cares if that's not what you do in your normal life, for example. So I think it's, it's, this is not trying to get out the answer. I just think it's a very difficult thing to to measure per se, but I think it's a hugely important thing to try and understand the, the patient's experience and where they are within their recovery and, and how mm. they can direct it. Um, I'm not sure it's easy to capture uh, yet. And I think we all, maybe we all need to put our heads together on that one. So, Manu, one to you. What, so I think what, what about in terms of trying to capture that? So... Uh... When they put together the NIHR grant, we had a PPI group discussion, and this was one of the problems that they highlighted, which is that we have this set risk. Um, we know that our, you know, when we recover from sepsis, it's not beyond a complete out of the woods. That is one of the kind of comments that led to this line of work. As part of the 
clinical trial. We, we have done a focus group after the internal pilot phase. And uh, the focus group consists of patients and clinicians uh, separately. And the patient's feedback were around the fact that things like we take for granted that you are a sepsis survivor. Sometimes the patients have never been told about this event as sepsis. Their bad infection is often what is told. So some of those communication things came out and they felt that a way of enhancing that information given to them and the clinicians and the um, other staff looking after these patients needs to understand that there is a risk and some way of addressing that is important to those survivors who took part in the vaccine trial. So we are doing some uh, work, but nothing remotely to measure the satisfaction of what we do. Uh, perhaps something that uh, I will pick it up after uh, this kind of meeting to do. So would the score, do you think, be, be shared with patients? Do you think it would be the results should be shared? Absolutely. Or, I guess it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no question about it. I think uh, all of the, so for example, the, the trial, we uh, have got the details of those who want to see the results before. And there is a, every year we have a um, participation group and the all the trial participants are invited to come. Um, so COVID meant that this, this autumn's one is cancelled, but we'll do something in the summer next year. Thank you. And Zudin? In terms of the patient engagement in the in the pickups, how, how so uh, part of this was the first almost that was almost the first thing that came back on the feedback, um, and so the pickups tool uh, has a pickups and pickups plus, which is one in ICU step down, one and one. And second, the second one is when you're in hospital, and in that is family engagement, family distress, um, and so there's families are engaged in the development of the rehabilitation prescription. That's the bottom line. Um, there's a, a linked comment, I think, in a and a is it feasible for the pickups tool to use screen patients outside intensive care? Um, the exact pickups tool that I've shown you, no, but um, next week, we will be uh, unveiling the, the, the next version of pickups, which will include a community pickups because we've been working with the Royal College of GPs. But importantly about the community pickups, it can be used as a self-reporting tool by patients. Um, and Lynn Turner-Stokes and Trisha Greenhall are going to be doing a webinar for the BMJ on the 16th of October, which is Friday, and I think it's about six o'clock in the evening, similar sort of time specifically about community pickups and rehabilitation and how this then uh, can be used in the, in the community. So there you go. And it's for, so it's, it can be used as self-reported. Thank you. I think perhaps there's a, there's a question here for you, Manu, but I, I think we'll, we'll pause there. And I'd just like to really thank all the speakers um, for their presentations, participation and engagement this evening. Um, I think we do need to reflect that perhaps we wouldn't be discussing this topic in so much detail, in particular the rehabilitation tool, if it hadn't been for what we've been through the last six months. So it's great that we're seeing some learning and, and, some, uh, and, we're, and we're being challenged in this area to improve the quality of care that we deliver. So that it's great that we've got some great plans coming forward as to how we're going to do that. So I'd like to thank the Intensive Care Society members again and donors for supporting this webinar this evening. I'd like to thank Matt Barlow, who's in the background, has put this all together. And, uh, and also thank you, the audience, for contributing and participating. And I want to remind you that this whole seminar will be uploaded on YouTube in the next couple of days. So please tell your friends about it and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you'll be able to watch this um, for the, over, the next, over the next many months. Thank you all. Good night. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.